I like this auditorium where I can see your faces. <laughs> Check. Check. Check one or two. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. So I said here and you. I'm just gonna walk on the page so we can have so I just do already up there? Can you hear me okay? Good? Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. I know it's a tough time of year and plus the weather was kind of annoying. So I really appreciate seeing all of you in your seats. I see some alums. And I see some regular students and visitors too, which is great. Um, I wrote down an introduction here because I wanted to say a bunch of stuff. So I'm gonna read it and I apologize. Uh, let's see, well, first of all, I should say I'm Kimberly Post. I'm a faculty here and also part of the Center for Sustainable Communities. So Francis Moore LePay has been the recipient of 20 honorary degrees and authored or co-authored 20 books, many focusing on themes of living democracy, suggesting a government accountable to citizens and a way of living aligned with the deep human need for connection, meaning, and power. Her first book, Diet for a Small Planet, published in 1971, has now sold 3 million copies. Its 50th anniversary edition was released in 2021 with features in the New York Times, Boston Globe, and other major outlets. By the way, it's going to be for sale on the second floor out here, and you can get it signed after this. In 2019, the New York Times Magazine interview with Francis began, Francis Moore LePay changed how we eat. She wants to do the same for our democracy. Did you really say that? <laughs> I still have my well-worn, somewhat dog-eared copy of Diet for a Small Planet. Um, I got the 10th anniversary edition, so that kind of is dating me right there. So in her most recent book, Daring Democracy, Igniting Power, Meaning, and Connection for the America We Want, it focuses on the roots of the US democracy crisis and how Americans are creatively responding to the challenge. Francis is co-founder of Oakland-based Food First, Vermont-based Center for Living Democracy, and the Cambridge-based Small Planet Institute. She has won numerous awards over the years, including the Rachel Carson Environmental Achievement Award in 20, 2003, and the prestigious James Beard Foundation Humanitarian of the Year Award in 2008. Frances was originally going to visit our campus in the spring of 2020, but something happened, let's call it COVID. It shut everything down. We decided to wait instead of doing a virtual talk. I'm, I'm sure you're very grateful for that. So several years later and 92 emails later, <laughs> we are very honored to be finally welcoming her to St. Joe's. So we're not gonna wait any longer now. So please join me in welcoming Francis Moore LePay. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, well, I can't tell you how thrilled I am. I can't express it strongly enough. I so love public speaking, and this is one of my first in person <laughs> in quite a long time. So uh, thank you for your warm welcome. Thank you, Kimberly, for all that you've done to um, make this happen and to be so kind to me. So I, let me get my, okay. So that is a very um, energizing image, I think. However, I would like to start with this. <laughs> and this is a little scary image, I agree. Um, 
but it underscores for me what is happening right now, that we are in the midst of enormous crisis, and I call it the big storm. And in a big storm, this is what happens. The roots you can see for the first time. And I, I sort of use that metaphor to keep myself energized that uh, there's something positive about having it all hitting us. And so my talk really weaves the climate crisis, the economic crisis, and our democracy crisis together as uh, three of the roots of this crisis, as you see here. So they all are interacting. They all influence one another. And that is really what I've learned over the last uh, you know, half century. And so that, that idea of everything being connected, I had a German friend who said to me once, he said, Frankie, in biological systems, in all systems, there are no parts, there are only participants. And so I want to underscore that, that these are all interacting with one another. And so I then started asking, and this started even more than 50 years ago when I was just a little older than you. And I was living in a world where we were told that there wasn't enough of anything, that we were running out of food and I was terrified. And I went to the library and I said, oh, is that true? And I realized pretty quickly, that no, there was enough food for all of us, right? But the world had had this frame of scarcity. And that was the beginning of this question of why would the brightest species, these big brains, why would be creating together a world that as individuals, none of us would choose? I bet you can't find anyone who says, yes, yes, starve them. Maybe <laughs> if they're uh, very twisted. But what I'm saying is that nobody gets up in the morning and says, yes, I want to make another child die of hunger, or yes, I want to make the planet hotter, right? It doesn't happen. So why are we together creating a world that we as individuals abhorred? And it was that moment in the UC Berkeley Library when I began to, to realize that, um, that um, it was our big brains <laughs> that were part of the problem. And what I mean by that is we don't see the world as it is, but as we are. This is the core question that I've been asking then all of my life. How is this possible? And my answer, I get a little help from Einstein. I like to throw him in before I hit you with my interpretation. Einstein, what he's getting at is that the theory, actually a scientist looks within the theory until it totally falls apart. So that we see through filters. And the way I put it is simply, I kind of ditch the idea that Seeing is believing, which is, a, say, something we hear all the time. And actually, for our species, it's our belief system that creates filters, and we can't see out of it. It's hard. We have to crack it. We have to admit that it's not working. And so part of my life is trying to break people out of a, of a belief system that is doing us in. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Now, what is that belief system? and I want to get at it here. It asks the question, what are we? Because it seems like a really important place to start for answers to any problem. What do we assume about human nature? Are we this? Are we that? And I feel that our culture tells us that, yeah, we can show up this way, but fundamentally it's over here, that all we can really count on is this left side, those very negative traits, right? I, that's my case, and you can push back and ask, <laughs> challenge me at any point in our discussion. So what I, I feel then, that that assumption, that a lack of both goods, there's not enough in the world, scarcity, scarcity, and there's not enough goodness in us, it sets, sets us on a path that I have called a spiral of powerlessness. And what I mean by that and yes, it undermines democracy, that if we really are this, these selfish little, selfish little shoppers, then of course we don't trust ourselves or our neighbors to come together in common problem solving. That's democracy. And we think, oh, we've got to turn over as much as we can to an impersonal force, the market. Do what brings highest return to existing wealth. Yes, that kind of market, not a uh, free market as we often hear. And then, 
that determines the winners or losers. And so wealth then inexorably concentrate because I, I'm arguing that there's really one rule to our kind of market. And then what happens there? Those left behind are blamed for their failure and divisions increase and concentrated power twists the political decisions to their benefit. And there we are. It's self-reinforcing because you see people showing up poorly, poorly in that. And it just con confirms the idea that we are just selfish, materialistic, and not very cooperative, right? So this is a core thesis I have about how our belief system shape us. And from there, what happens? From there, the spiral of powerlessness, powerlessness ends up creating the conditions that bring out the very worst in us. And so here is the question um, um, that this is what that spiral brings forth, right? And I don't think many people appreciate how extreme our country is. I'm not gonna go over these. You can see them pretty clearly, I hope. Um, and that's my case right there, that we end up with that kind of America. And so, um, and it also works at another level. That another level is that um, uh, they bring, sorry, um, this worst, did I? Okay. Um, yes, this is failing because it fails to meet this deep human need for power, meaning, and connection. This system, this belief system, I'm arguing, undercuts us in a number of ways that are beyond just the material, just the income concentration, and extreme poverty, that our deepest need for dignity is, is undermined following from this belief system. And so what do we do? What do we do? Now, what shows up then is the reframe that human beings are not uh, either or, that we have capacities for both. That is a radical reframe. And one piece of that for me was that in studying a little of the history of the Holocaust and realizing that regular people, you know, ordinary family people did horrendous things, uh, would end up killing people at point blank that you would never have imagined. And so my view is that we don't know whether we would be one of those or ones who would resist until we're tested. But pretty much I'm arguing that depending on the social conditions that we create, a lot more of us or a lot fewer of us can act toward one another with dignity or brutality. And so that's why it's so critical that we step up and create the conditions that bring forth the very best in us. And so that is what I'm really, really taking in here. And the conditions then are these three. Can you see the slide okay? I'm kind of walking in front of it. <laughs> but they are uh, uh, that the conditions then are continuous dispersion of power. So we all participate in power. Transparency, so we know what's going on. Not all those secrets in the White House. And a culture of mutual accountability instead of the blame, blame, blame. And we've so fallen into the blame of, you know, blaming poor people for their problems or uh, lately blaming immigrants somehow. And actually, um, you know, that they're bad people. I just wanted to tell you a little personal experience I had after, you know, hearing about, uh, you know, all the bad things they said about immigrants, for example, in this blaming culture, that um, I remembered back uh, about, you know, especially immigrants at this point, I had the occasion to go to a labor camp, a farm, farm uh, labor camp in the Midwest uh, many years ago. And I spoke with a farm worker there who was dying of cancer because of her exposure to farm chemicals. And sitting in the kitchen, her children were playing. And she said, I don't understand. We bring you your food. Why don't you appreciate us? And so, you know, just to walk in the shoes of people who get blamed in this very blaming culture, even for a moment for me, 
it was very, very touching and, and life-changing. I had my daughter with me too, and she heard that. And I think it, it, it really changed her life as well. So what I'm suggesting is though, that as we, as we move into this away from the blame and into a, a culture of mutual accountability, we realize that we can't just point fingers, that we're all in one way or another connected to creating the rules that, that set it up so that some people are like that woman situation in the labor camp. And so this, this is really what um, defines my core ideas about living democracy as a root solution. Um, and so the, the other thing is that um, the realization then that um, yes, indeed, the, the conditions we create then can do what? They can reverse that circle, that vicious circle of, of disempowerment and poverty and a disappointment. And it starts with a very different assumption. And that is that we together create the rules. We're not just simply selfish and materialistic. If we create the rules in the way that bring out the best, then we can begin this, this very positive uh, reinforcing cycle of empowerment. And so we create the rules that bring out rules that bring out the best. That means certainly getting money out of politics and a government then freed from private wealth. And so rules can ensure transparency and living democracy evolves and, and fear and blame recede. So this is very much the opposite of the other spiral I told you. And I think it is still very much possible. Um, and so that enables us, this spiral of empowerment that enables us to um, go to root solutions, back to my original slide of the root the roots of the tree showing and the roots of our problems. So certainly uh, each has uh, pieces of the answer underway right now. And so I'm going to, the rest of my talk, I really want to dig into um, a little bit each of these, this spiral empowerment creating alignment, <clears throat> uh, making it possible then to align with nature and, um, and in many other ways, advance. <laughs> so um, so um, we can then, we can then, um, we can then tame our brutal form of capitalism. And here are, I just, you know, I'm sure many of you would have um, that <laughs> um, a longer list, but there are seven or so ways in which we know how to um, break free from this brutal form of capitalism that so concentrates wealth. I don't have to read all those for you. And, um, and that then um, leads me on that I want to go deeper into the other route, uh, our assault on nature, uh, and then the democracy challenge. Now, the assault on nature, yes, there is uh, the climate, but I want to also mention that there is um, uh, this challenge of um, species decimation. In the writing, the 50th anniversary edition of Diver Small Planet, I relied on David Attenborough. Do you ever see him on TV, the um, natural historian? But he says that we are in the sixth great extinction of life in terms of species. And a good part of that, a good part of it is because of our agricultural system. And it's the, the um, chemicals as well as the overuse of the land. 80% of our agricultural land goes to feed livestock that then uh, return only 18% of the calories that we eat. So it's incredibly inefficient. And it means then that we are destroying, um, that we are destroying incredible uh, biodiversity. Eight in 10, eight in 10 of the Earth's wild mammals are now gone, and about 40% of all insect species are predicted to be gone in a, in a few decades. So this is part of our climate emergency, definitely. Um, but I want to also register the particular ways in which the United States stands out as what I call a climate culprit. Um, that um, 
we are, uh, yes, we are, uh, that we are the world's second worst greenhouse gas emitter after China uh, with about 5% of the world's population, 28% of the emissions. And um, that, um, yes, um, four times more than the, than the average emission. So um, I just want to register that. A lot of my talk is about the positive, but we need to grasp this deep, deep root. And so why is it? Why is it? Um, and I think of this outsized impact um, that um, especially um, we're, we're seeing now with um, uh, the debate about how do we deal with the surging gas prices, et cetera, and temptation to push for more uh, oil and gas, um, that we can start at a very, very clear point and stop using our public dollars, our tax dollars to subsidize fossil fuels. That seems like a really, really basic, basic demand. And um, so there is a call for that. Uh, 20 billion in our tax dollars now are going to subsidize fossil fuels. And, um, and this is truly, as I've all pointed out, the result of a very corrupted political system. Um, and I, I don't wanna make myself sound like a partisan, but I do want to clarify that that money rushing in from the fossil fuel industry that gets us so hooked and unable to disconnect. There are um, eight times more fossil fuel money donations are going to Republicans compared to Democrats. So that's where they have a better chance because as you know, there's a lot of resistance to Biden's efforts to deal with the climate crisis. Uh, so um, overall, overall, what is needed now? What is needed now? What is needed now? That uh, aligning with nature, healing with the earth, facing this sixth grade extinction, uh, and recognizing that we also have to um, heal our unsafe water, and that is now that last, <laughs> that last estimate of the impact of water pollution, mainly from, from chemicals in farming, has ended up creating a dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico that has grown now to the size of the state of Connecticut. This is this line down here, and I've told you about that already. So this is a big, big deal. And so, um, so um, where do we go? Uh, the news, the, um, oh, excuse me. Um, uh, certainly, we can tell our representatives to stop funding a fossil, to stop, um, um, we can tell her to stop taking uh, fossil fuel money, that's for sure. And, um, and that uh, we can also um, re really push for what Biden has already requested, 45 billion for several federal approaches to tackle the climate crisis. It's not enough, but it is in the right direction. And one very respected group said that the technical potential to fulfill uh, Biden's pledge to cut emissions in half, uh, has, in, it has that possibility to cut emissions in half from 05 levels uh, by 2030. So um, overall then, a new study, it says that um, um, these are also really critical pieces of the Build Back Better uh, approach, and I think I've um, covered some of that. Um, and I was particularly excited about the public transit um, approach in it and focusing on disadvantaged neighborhoods. And uh, also, as you'll see in a minute when I go into the food and farming part, that I was really glad that uh, farmers and, farm and forests were part of this and that is what Biden is up to. Um, and so um, that is, is encouraging. And, um, and now, so where do we go? Um, that 
Many though, <laughs> sure you're not gonna be surprised at this, um, that it, recognizing that it's now stalled in Congress, it hasn't happened yet, stalled by Republican resistance and the influence of money. But some are also outraged, certainly the Sunrise Movement, are you aware of the Sunrise Movement of young people? Um, are, are, uh, are not pleased with it and feel that it has not gone, it's not gone far enough. And uh, they want it not to just be about the enticing fossil fuels to, industry to do something different, but really changing the rules and enforcing them. So, and, and again, it's this cycle with the corporate influence in our system. So um, what is now underway I'm excited about is that a lot of environmental organizations are working on a pledge where they're getting uh, citizens to ask uh, their legislators to reject any fossil fuel donations. There are now dozens of environmental organizations that are part of this. Anything above $200 that is from a fossil fuel company and are, are sponsoring 10 pieces of a Green New Deal uh, uh, and want them then sign on this petition campaign is to get their legislators not to take fossil fuel money and to sign on to a battery of truly progressive uh, climate action agenda items. And so in all, <laughs> uh, I think it is very clear to certainly the international body, uh, the IPCC that keeps us abreast of where we stand in terms of climate change, that we are very much now in right at a do or nine moment. This is the time to make big change. And so um, this is the make it or break it time. And in, in so many ways, I'm so impressed that Maine has been a leader. And I'm gonna highlight one of my heroes here shortly, but that I was just delighted to see that, um, that as we make this, take on this make or break moment, uh, that there is a national movement for state constitutional amendments requiring uh, a healthy environment for all of us. And I, I think I'm right on this. I read that Maine is one of the, one of the leaders on this initiative and that, um, that uh, Pennsylvania and uh, Montana, I believe, have had this for, for years and New York is now considering it. So, and a dozen or so states have initiatives underway in this direction. So I think this is a really interesting approach to actually put our right to a healthy environment into our state constitutions. And so from there, um, then um, um, we can see these possibilities of change and, um, and um, that I wanted to focus, I bet you won't be surprised about this given my history of my own writing, but really focus on um, what we eat and why it matters so much. Um, because that was my beginning when I started, I thought food was the basis of all, of course. So, and now it's even more, more of a, of a centerpiece of problem solving, both for health, bodily health and for the earth. And so I'll just stay for a moment on, um, on, the, on the food and ag question. Um, because we think of greenhouse gas emissions as mainly about smokestacks and <laughs> oil and, and fossil fuel piping and that sort of thing. But actually our food system contributes about 37% of all greenhouse gas emissions. And food from animals is responsible about 70% of food production emissions. Um, worldwide, livestock contribute about 14.5 um, um, 14.5 um, um, percent. And um, so largely uh, for meat production, agriculture uh, causes 75% of deforestation and uses 70% of the world's available water. Now, why is agriculture so intensively the current form of agriculture so intensive in its water consumption. Well, um, um, it takes to produce one pound of beef requires 1800 gallons of water. However, however, there is a huge shift now 
and that is working to help us stay within our planetary boundaries by shifting uh, uh, agriculture away from grain-fed meat and using our organic or ecological met methods of farming. And so that is, that is really a big, big deal because without changing our diet, this, this quote, it's World Resources Institute, I just ran across it and I found it very stunning. I'll let you read that. <laughs> Uh, but it says how important this is that without this change, we're not going to make it. So, um, so um, then I want to give a shout out to my daughter who was early on the case, um, uh, Anna LaPay, in her book, Diet for a Hot Planet, that came out in 2009. And uh, she then argues that indeed that um, these are pretty clear statements of possibility. In the interest of time, I won't read them, uh, but um, I think that it's powerful. And this point about food waste is just huge for me. So that we've known for a while, as I say, this came out in 09. I think it was one of the very first books about agriculture contribution that was for a popular audience. And so, uh, but, we are, and I want to turn now away from food and ag and just talk a little bit more about the, uh, what is happening that is hopeful. We need, I believe, <laughs> hope has power. It gets us out of our seats, yes. And so I'm going to point out here in the United States that these numbers of cities and towns are committing to 100% and that um, uh, almost one in three are living in places that have committed. And I just think that's so critical because cities throughout the world are the major contributors in terms of greenhouse gases. And that is huge, huge, huge. Um, and I uh, also wanted to then talk about our more direct citizen um, personal action. And are any of, any of you familiar with the podcast of Bertunde um, Thurston? No? Well, he's, he has a podcast called How to Citizen. And I love this. I love this, making citizen into a verb. So are you citizening? <laughs> Let's citizen today. So um, uh, he talks about the tool of citizening. Then one of them he stresses is divestment. That's possible uh, for institutions, for individuals. And um, so that is a, already happening. Um, I don't know about this college, but there are that many that have been divesting worldwide and foundations and cities, divesting their funds from supporting fossil fuel. And I am very impressed with that. So uh, they, uh, and of course that takes a lot of, of student action <laughs> and, um, and faculty and staff and all. And so I, I just think it's a great example of how to citizen. Um, and then um, how do we uh, more uh, staying motivated, being encouraged? For me, um, noting that others, you know, that I found that, that first bullet up there really encouraging that, wait, Europeans live a very comfortable lifestyle and look how much less they harm the earth. I thought that was pretty encouraging uh, for people who fear, you know, that we have to go back to, something uh, you know, that's not so modern. They are pulling it off. And then uh, this uh, nine and a half million people in already in full-time jobs. And then uh, I just learned this, this about the potential of offshore wind not very long ago. And that's beginning to pick up on the East Coast, but just that potential is staggering that this could 90% uh, um, estimate of its potential. So I and also, since I grew up in Texas, I don't know if you can tell by the way I talk, but I grew up in Texas and I would never have guessed that my state would have become a leader. And um, so it's, it's quite dramatic here that it's not just the blue states, but there are red states that are taking the leadership. And two of them are Texas, uh, that if it were, a, what is it? If it were a country, it would be, uh, the world's fifth largest, that's right, fifth largest producer of wind energy. And then Georgia, 
again, didn't think of it as a leader in green and look what they've done. So we can't, we can't pigeonhole people uh, into red and blue on this and take heart from that kind of progress. And, um, and so then getting more personal, um, uh, uh, we um, can certainly, um, uh, as, as I've already pointed out, um, you know, getting, um, shifting our diets toward the direction of, of uh, plant-centered eating, which is so much more ecological. But um, another piece of this for me is um, uh, the, um, 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 about staying encouraged and um, is, is um, really that um, we um, appreciate what individuals can do and uh, what my hero. Do you know of Chloe Maxman? Do you know her? Well, <laughs> um, I talked to her years ago when she had just graduated from Harvard and she was leader of the divestment movement there. And she said, I wanna go back to Maine and live in my hometown, but I don't know what work I could do. Oh, she said, maybe I could run for office. <laughs> and so she did in a very, very young person, obviously, and it was a district, it is a district, I'm forgetting the number of it, but that it's unusually uh, elder population there, it's older than normal for the rest of your state. And she went door to door to door. And she told me about, she went down this path to a man in a trailer home who'd never been approached by a candidate. And he told her that she was the first and she, he would vote for her. And so she won and she pushed forth a Green New Deal um, and including solar power for schools. And now she is a state senator. So I, I use people like Chloe to lift my spirits about, uh, it's not possible to know what's possible, which I'm gonna to return to in a moment. And so Chloe is, is definitely, um, definitely a hero to me and weaves together so many of the messages that I wanna to share today. Now, ah, here we are. Now, here we are. Uh, now to the root solutions for our corrupted democracy. This is what I'm suggesting is that yes, there is an environmental, a racial justice, a labor and a democracy movement of movements. I think it's historic. People are coming together and recognizing they can't progress on any of these points unless we have democracy answering to us. And so I'm very excited to be alive right now in this historic moment. And here we are that, um, the, the emphasis of it, of this movement of movement is pretty obvious, the money out of politics. And there I give another shout out to Maine as the, one, of the country, one of our country's leaders in public financing, which allowed Chloe to run for office, for sure. So good for you. And, uh, uh, and I also love what they've done in Seattle to give uh, citizens a voucher that they can, a money voucher, each one was worth 25 bucks that they can give to candidates of their choice. That's the way their public financing works and disclosure. So these are the three kind of, uh, three arms of the living democracy movement, this movement of movements. And um, uh, this is, this is to say why it's so important. If you're not totally convinced by my talk, uh, this is so stunning to me. And that's why I threw it, in, threw it right next to the democracy movement slide. Because um, to me, to know that our, repre our representatives, that the people we elect to represent us, there, for every one of them, there are 20 lobbyists in Washington lobbying for private interest for every one person we elect to go there. So I just put this up here to remind us of the problem that Congress people spend 30 to 70% of their time. Um, how are we doing? 
Oh, thank you, thank you. Okay, so I just threw that in to just to pump us up a little bit more. But in this movement of movement, I am so proud to say our little institute, really little institute, has teamed up with an organization called Democracy Initiative. Any, you, please go to this website, democracymovement.us, and you can see and participate in all of these different things I'm talking about uh, in learning about this movement of movements. And their organization has 45 organizations representing about 60 million Americans. So it really speaks to this, this idea of uh, the citizening as a verb. And I really love that. I really love that. So um, now, sorry. Um, okay. Now, here we are. So, oh, sorry, sorry. I wanted to introduce you to another young inspirer of mine about, you know, we, we had these different, the three different arms of the democracy movement. And one of them is fair districting. Hey, do you know the term gerrymandering? The idea of drawing party lines, bipartisan interests that then make it impossible for the other party to win? It's called gerrymandering. And so Katie, who this sort of tells her story a few years ago, um, it was 2018, in her early 20s, she just put like think, one post up on social media. And <laughs> ultimately, people all across the state said, yes, 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 we want a state initiative of citizens put forward to stop gerrymandering, right? And uh, they ended up getting such a response. They had town meetings and libraries all across the state. They collected 425,000 signatures and it passed. And there's a fabulous movie that's been made about Katie that you can probably find by Googling. It's very cinematic. It's not teachy at all. It really gets you into what she experienced. And you see the, the, these young people carrying these boxes of, of uh, petitions that they had to get uh, uh, signatures to pass for an independent districting commission instead of partisan districting commission. And so she's another one of my superheroes, Katie Fahey. Um, and so now then, uh, this is, I'm beginning to wrap up here on the more emotional side, uh, because often I think that, that we think of democracy as a dull a duty or at best kind of boring. You gotta get down, you gotta mark your calendar. When am I gonna, well, dull, it's not exciting. But if we really think about democracy as a way of life, the values of which permeate all of our social relationships, and we are willing to get out of our comfort zone to be part of it. And believe me, that picture of me, you see, I was out of my comfort zone. I, I ended up in 2016, walking from Philadelphia to Washington, DC, and getting arrested on the Capitol steps. And honestly, <laughs> I was afraid it was gonna be that little old lady they mattered to carry off, you know? I walked the whole way and I sat on the steps and the thrill of democracy for me was so real because I did step out of my comfort zone. I met people I would never have met otherwise. I realized, oh wait, as I was walking into the Capitol, uh, walking with all these other people and the dome of the Capitol appeared in my eyes, I started weeping with the emotion, the feeling that, oh, wait a minute, I know <laughs> they answer to me. I'm in charge. And, and you know, you think of that the august buildings in, in DC as the people who run everything, but in a democracy, there's they are answerable to us. And so that was that's where my partner at that, you know, on that trip, uh, a young man that I wrote um, Daring Democracy with, he's 50, 49 years younger than I am. And we marched together and we agreed on every word of that book after being so inspired by that march. So getting out of our comfort zones, trying what we thought we could not do. I'm gonna uh, say more about that, but that was a really key part of what I call the thrill of democracy. Bonding with strangers, realizing that you can do more than you thought you could, which is I call civil courage and movement from being a victim to being an owner of our democracy. So that then really uh, says to me that uh, we are at a point then where just being good 
is good, but it's not enough. That courage is our call. And I don't think this means that we have to be fearless. I don't think any of us can be fearless. But I think the idea of this moment, what's called on is to realize that fear is pure energy, that we can do with what we please. <laughs> that is the big breakthrough. And I, uh, I once just, just personally, I'll share you this moment. I was in an audience and I don't like to speak out in audiences and uh, some Al Gore was speaking and I really wanted to, uh, his position a little bit put, but I was with friends who I was afraid they would be very offended that I might criticize Al Gore, God forbid. So I, I was got really nervous. And what happened is my heart started going like this. And I said, oh, you always talk about reframing things. Why don't, Frankie, why don't you reframe that as your inner applause? So I'm recommending uh, that we understand that to do what we thought we could not do will trigger fear. But remember uh, that that fear can be energy that can be transformed. And also remember that, um, that indeed courage is contagious, that somebody is always watching you. And the cho only choice we don't have is whether to change the world. Every act we take and do not take, someone is watching. And those ripples will go farther than you could ever know, of course, of course. So that really is uh, the key to um, uh, my uh, thought about where we are now and to underscore that to make this journey for true living democracy, to heal our relationship to the earth, we do not have to be optimists. What I mean by that is in a world where everything is connected and everything is a continuous change, all we have to do is recognize that it's not possible to know what's possible. How can we know? Because things are moving and it's all connected. So I don't call myself an optimist. I call myself a possibilist. And that's plenty good for most of us. Most human beings know, do not need certainty of success in order to go. That when you applied to this school, were you certain of your success? No, but you took the risk, you did it. So I just love this idea that it's not possible to know what's possible. And really that this allows this hope in action and that um, and this is our power today because hope actually organizes our brains towards solutions. And so I'll close with uh, some words that have been on my wall for probably 40 years written by a Chinese who said, Hope cannot be said to exist, nor can it be said not to exist, for it is like, it is like the roads across the earth. In the beginning, there were no roads, but when many people walk one way, a road is made. Thank you so very, very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We're going to do questions now. And I mean, I'd love any feedback <laughs> in any form, except maybe some <laughs> throwing good rocks at me. So if you have any questions, go ahead and raise your hand and we'll get a microphone over to you. There was one part I was a little confused about yes. during your slideshow. You. Uh -huh. um, you were talking about like ecological farming and like mm -hmm. reducing like water pollution. There was on the slide, it said that like ecological farming reduces water pollution, but then mm -hmm. you were also talking about the dead zone that was the size of oh, Connecticut. Yeah, yeah that is confusing. I'm sorry. Yeah. Can I speak to that or is there more? Yeah, I, I, I have to say I'm pulling so many pieces after the, into the, a, new, a new speech I've never given before. So uh, what 
I'll look definitely look at that. But no, I didn't mean at all to say that it was ecological agriculture. The the um, prominent form of corporate driven and very monopoly driven agriculture is the culprit of just the massive use of pesticides creating that dead zone. It, it runs off into the waterways all across the Midwest in particular, of course, and into the Mississippi and down to the Gulf. So I have to make sure I'll go back and look at that. And that reducing, what I wanted to say, that reducing uh, that uh, and moving to ecological and organic practices would be a great, great uh, step forward. In fact, that one quote said that without changing the way we eat and therefore the way we farm, that we can't make this, we can't make it to a safe place uh, with our climate reduction, climate uh, emissions. Um, so I hope that's clear. That's what I meant to say. <laughs> um, that actually leads into another question I had about yeah. monopolies. So um, when we were talking about like what we need to change for things to like start leading in a better light, uh, it said anti-monopoly um, policies or like enforcing <laughs> anti-monopolies, which I don't necessarily de disagree with, but are you talking about like completely eradicating monopolies? Because I know in places like Maine, like especially up north, it's hard for people to get access to electricity and water without monopolies because sometimes it is cheaper for people mm -hmm. to have like for monopolies to exist. So I didn't know if like there was ever a time where you thought about maybe like a more ethical version of monopoly or how to overcome that. Well, I think increasingly, and I, I don't know anything about Maine situation, but I know reading about the Midwest that actually the lowest prices come from uh, utilities that are run cooperatively, that cooperative utilities pub and public utilities are, um, are, have better prices for consumers than just private and monopoly, corporate monopoly. So that makes a lot of sense to me that something that was in the public sphere and or a uh, uh, privately owned but cooperative utility would have the best prices. So I would love to know more about that. But I think in general, I'm right that 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 other way of, of organizing our economy that's more fair and uh, there's you know more feedback into the system from all of us that logically it would have better pricing. So I will look into what you say. Thank you. Hello there. Hi. Um, do you have an idea of what the title of your next book is going to be? <laughs> well, I have a book title, but I don't have a book. And um, the title came to me in a kind of a magical way. So it has power. And it's simply Democracies, Democracy, apostrophe S, Calling, Democracies Calling. And it can be, it can have the kind of this double entendre that democracy is a calling and democracy is calling us. And um, so I, my goal had been, um, when I got the title, I, I thought, oh, if I could share stories from other countries of democracy working, uh, as many of you in political science would know that uh, like the European systems are so different than ours, the parliamentary systems, but there may be, you know, there may be a way I could do that. Do you like the title? <laughs> yes, thumbs up. Yeah. Um, by the way, I, I am I just finishing a report that was one of the hardest things I've done. But if you um, let, let me know if you're interested in seeing it. Um, it started out, well, the title as of today is called The Crisis of Trust. And it's asked the questions, how do democracies defend themselves against dangerous lies? How do we respect freedom of speech? and also not have the kind of destruction that we're having in this economy, I mean, excuse me, in this nation because of lies, disinformation. And if any of you are interested in that, I'd love your feedback because I'm really going out on a limb. My son is a journalist who's really a free speech person. I haven't shown it to him yet, but I, I'm gonna get there. Um, but if you would like to see that, uh, it's only about 28 pages or so right now. Um, please let me know, and it will ultimately it'll go on our website after I get feedback. But thank you, thank you for that <laughs> that question. Do you have any follow up? 
Okay. Oh, good. So you spoke a little bit about getting money out of politics. <clears throat> How would you um, go about trying to get money out of politics when there is so much money going into it? Well, this is the, this is the whole agenda of this movement of movements. And uh, there are many pieces of it, but I think number one is public financing of which Maine and Connecticut are the leaders and able to produce um, people like, allow people like Chloe to win. And very few Americans know that's possible, very few. So part of it is, is just popular education of spreading the word about what can happen. And I haven't studied Maine recently, but I bet there are wonderful things that you could, you could share and you probably are that I've missed, but how public financing has not only, um, I looked at the figures that now about two thirds of your legislators have run on public money. So they're not, you know, they're not in the pocket of. And, um, you know, what have been the practical outcomes of that shift? I know in a book I wrote years ago when I was writing about public financing like Maine has done with um, your system of matching funds that um, uh, you had been able to pass legislation that was very controversial and defeated elsewhere that kept a lot of discarded electronics out of your ecosystem and a lot of really dangerous chemicals out of your ecosystem. I'm forgetting the facts on that. And, and just, you know, just the more that we can make it real for people. This is not a pipe dream. This is not just, you know, that, and that how extreme America is in this way to give people hope that, that there are alternatives. So I think Connecticut and Maine are, have a very special role to play. And to, and to remind people, you know, I can remember Jimmy Carter and Jimmy Carter couldn't ran on public money, you know, for president and won. Uh, so we can do this, we have done this. I think, especially for young people, it's so important to remind yourselves that it hasn't always been this way, you know, that, that the world that I, out, right out of college, my first job was with the war on poverty. That was a government sponsored program in which I went door to door organizing for the welfare rights organization in Philly, very poor people. So government felt like it was on my side, you know, that, that we can have that again. And I'm going off from your question, but please continue. Is, did I answer your question? Yes, you did. Thank okay, you. Okay, good. This isn't a question, yes. but that you mentioned Chloe Maxman, and I don't know if you said how old she is. I don't know. I know when I interviewed her, she was 24, 25. She's still in her 20s, She's I'm pretty sure. Her 20s. And I don't know if people here are aware that the current speaker of the Maine House of Representatives, he might be the youngest speaker of a legislature in the entire country. Um, Ryan Fecto, he's 29 years old. Wow. <laughs> so just for students here to realize, the Speaker of the Main House is less than 10 years older than any one of you. That I'm is guessing. amazing. So um, that's pretty amazing, especially in a state that actually has the oldest population in the state. It is, so, it um, is. I, I, I'll just, Frankie, if you don't mind my asking, how many of you here think you might run for office? <laughs> Maybe someday. Well, cool. <laughs> another friend of mine um, was Deborah. Deborah. Um, uh, now I'm blanking. Anyway, she was a waitress in Auburn, Maine, and ran for for office and won. And I just I got to know her and just was so excited. And she was quite a leader as well. Um, and then Coke Money came in and defeated her. Deborah Simpson is her name. Uh, but nonetheless, she made a big impact, and we have to now figure out how to keep out uh, that kind of spoiler. But um, I think Maine has a very special role to play, and I'm delighted to learn about the 29-year-old. Thank you for telling me that. 
So I think we're going to have to stop now so that we have time for book signing, but let's give Francis another round of applause. <laughs> And we have books for sale out here on the second floor in the lobby and feel free she'll be out there momentarily and she'll sign them in whatever you request and thank yep. you all so much for coming.